Well, good morning, everybody. Happy Sunday. It's good to be with you. I'm still feeling joy from last um, Sunday, Easter celebration, seeing so many people, and it was just such a joyful day. And here we continue. Um, today, we are going to be doing, looking at the Beatitudes, which is what Pastor Jeff has been going through, not just the Beatitudes. He's doing the whole Sermon on the Mount, but he's invited different people to share and reflect on one of the Beatitudes that resonates with them. And he and his wife, Patty, are away in Austin this week and for a much-needed vacation and a wedding. So I get to step in. And there are a few new faces in here that I don't know. If I haven't met you before, I'm the children's pastor here, and my name is Toby. And when I'm here in the big church, I say it's like being at the big kids' table. So it's good to be with you guys. Um, We're going to start with a slide that is a quote from one of Pastor Jeff's sermons just uh, talking about what the Beatitudes are. And he describes them as being concerned with the inward disposition of the heart and a standard of righteousness. The focus comes in a posture of meekness, humility, surrender, mourning, and repentance. And through this, we have a hunger. And as that hunger is met by Christ, it starts to result in mercy and purity of heart and in peace. And when that happens, we start to shine, refined in humility, and the light and texture pours out like glory. Not only does it shine, but it preserves. It holds back the moral decay of society. So it is salt and light. So um, what I'd like to do is go ahead and read through all of the Beatitudes, but have you guys read it with me. And as you do, I want you to notice, is there a Beatitude that stands out to you? If Jeff said, I want you to give a sermon on the Beatitudes, which one of these would you want to share on? And then maybe later too, if there's one that stood out to you, just to go home and take the time and think about it, see and ask God if there might be something he wants to show you through it. But... Let's start by reading together. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Wow. Did one of the Beatitudes stand out to you? Overall, it's pretty amazing. The way down is the way up in God's kingdom. Um, When I read through it and I had the opportunity, the one that stood out to me was, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. And that is because I really long to have a pure heart. And I really want to see God. And I'm attracted to people that have a pure heart. You know them when you meet them. They are authentic and real. They want to see others succeed. They're loving and they're forgiving. They're just pure and simple and true. And um, they're trusting and full of wonder. And they desire to see God. I've been praying for us and getting ready for the sermon that God would help us to gaze at him and to have the eyes of our hearts enlightened, flooded with the light of his spirit, so that he can transform our own hearts and make them pure. Uh, Let's pray before we get into it. Dear Heavenly Father, you are the source of all pure and good things. You are lovely. You are faithful. You are true. You are kind. You are patient. And you are the God who sees. Help us to see you in return. Give us a spiritual perception and receptiveness. Enable us to taste and see that you are good. Help us to turn to you, to surrender our hearts, and dip them in the streams of life. Cleanse us and hide us in you and purify our hearts. As we gaze at you through your your word this morning, I pray that you would open it up to us and give us understanding. We ask all these things in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. 
So, um, in wanting to have a pure heart, I just looked up some definitions to get started, and one is the word pure. And in this verse, the word pure comes from a Greek word that means clean. But there's other words to define what pure is, and they are authentic, true, refined, clear, simple, humble, sparkling, wholesome, fresh. When something is pure, it's single-focused. It's unmixed with any other matter. It's free from contamination and from moral fault. One of my favorite definitions describes pure as being in tune, and it's used uh, of a musical n tone. So a pure, t t uh, pure tone is one that's being in tune. Chris Lazat said that the Beatitudes should be called the Beatitunes because he said that they're like a God note that the followers of Jesus tune themselves to. And when we are carrying this God note inside of us, it actually spills out, it reverberates, and it ripples, and it helps to tune others to that note as well. Um, and the word heart, we might think of the heart and the mind as separate things, but in this uh, verse in Hebrews, the heart is the center and the whole core of the inner man. It includes the mind and the will and the feelings. It's all of it. And the understanding, it's spoken of in relation to spiritual perception, and it's also the central spring of all of our words and our actions. It's the rightful throne of God, and when he's reigning, his kingdom is present in us. Our greatest command is to love God with all of our heart, with a pure and single focus. Um, Jesus admonished the religious leaders of his day for following the letter of the law, but neglecting the, the inward part, the, the matters of the heart. He called the Pharisees blind. He said that they should first clean the inside of the cup so that the outside of the cup would be clean as well. And that's what he desires to do for us, to work on the inside out. In Luke, it says, the good man brings good things out of the good treasure of his heart. And the evil man brings evil things out of the evil treasure of his heart. For out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. So what's in our heart will come out and it will shape our life. So we want to make God our treasure so that we're bringing good things out of our heart. But who is able to have a pure heart? In Isaiah 64, verse 6, it says, All of us have become like one who is unclean. All of our righteous acts are like filthy rags. We all shrivel up like a leaf, and like the wind our sins sweep us away. Every one of us falls short of the glory of God. But, but God, I love that. Every time we see but God, we're going to see his graciousness towards man. Ezekiel 36, 25 and 26, the prophet is speaking of the Messiah. He says, I will also sprinkle clean water on you and you will be clean. I will cleanse you from all your impurities and all your idols. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will remove your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. How good is that? Every single one, everyone is able to obtain a pure heart. Everyone is able to come to the streams of life. Because God gives us a new heart. He puts a new spirit within us. And when we look to him and we believe, our hearts are made pure. John 6, 40 says, For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who looks on the Son and believes in him should have eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. Those who look to him are radiant. Their faces will never be ashamed. I love that verse. It doesn't matter what you have said or done or thought in your life, there isn't anything that would take you too far from God's grace and his mercy. We look to him, and we become radiant because of, of what he's done. So that leads us to our next portion, which is, how do we get a pure heart? And it starts by, first, deciding that we want a pure heart. In the book of Proverbs, it speaks of wisdom, and we know that wisdom is pure, and Jesus himself is the wisdom of God toward us. And when it says to how to get wisdom, it says to get it. Decide you want it and then strive after it. So if we want a pure heart, we just decide we want it. And we start um, looking toward God in order to receive it. So we turn toward him as the next step. We decide we want it and then we turn. We humble ourselves like children. Jesus tells us to turn and become like children in order to enter the kingdom of heaven. 
And I love working with kids. I love being the children's pastor. They are such good company. Um, I have a slide of a couple of kids from our church, the Hunter's kids. And I love this. It's pure joy. They're just fully enjoying the sunshine, the sand, the sea, playing, being kids. And Jesus wants us to learn from the children and remember the child that's inside of every one of us. We're supposed to grow up, but there's a childlikeness that we're supposed to treasure and hold on to. Children are pure in heart. They live in a state of awe and wonder. They love butterflies and bubbles and empty boxes and the moon and Christmas lights and roly polies. Um, they're not critical or jaded. They always want to play and invent and explore. Many of them are friendly and loving and trusting. They live in joy and they depend well on others. And as we get older, though, we see that this world is hard, it's difficult, and the journey can just cause us to lose our sense of amazement, awe, wonder, hope, trust. And so we need to come to Jesus and keep coming and having him cleanse our heart to renew that. He wants us to have this healthy, thriving, whole heart and depending on him like kids depend on him. So we decide we want a pure heart. We turn to Jesus and then we come. We have to take a step toward him. Toward Jesus, the fountain of living waters, abundant life, forgiveness, and mercy. Um, I think that in some point in your life, somewhere, you probably have an image of either a fountain or a pond or the sea or a stream where you've experienced something with some really clear, lovely waters. I can't imagine what it will really be like when we see the, the river of life in heaven, but right now we sense this river of life that Jesus brings to us. My husband had a chance to uh, hike the JMT trail and so many of his pictures, so beautiful. There's these streams that run through everything of this pure water that comes from this freshly melted snow. So we can draw near to God through his spirit. He will open our eyes and change our hearts. And his word says that when we draw near to him, he will draw near to us. When we come to him, he will come to us. So the next thing we do is we believe we trust in the redemption that he gives us through his death and resurrection. And then we surrender. We give him our heart and we invite him in. And sometimes this can be difficult. If you need help surrendering, if you feel uh, something holding you back, like a wall, don't just ignore it. Pay attention to where the resistance is, just like you pay attention to where the drawing and the longing is and talk to God about it. Why am I resisting you? What's holding me back? Because as interested as God is in your heart, you also have an enemy who's very interested in your heart and wants to do everything he can to separate you from God. So take all of your everything and bring it to God every day. Be honest. There was a time in my life where I had already given my life to God, but I, um, he was showing me that I was taking my heart back. Um, I had thought that if you asked me, I would say that my priorities in life were God's number one, my husband's number two, then my kids, and then my work, and it was completely flipped upside down. My kids were first. I'd, even though that they were good and I, I love being a mother, I'd, I'd pretty much made him an idol in my life. My husband was second, and God, I don't know where he was in that, and he, he was showing me that um, I actually had like a, a vision or an image of my heart in my hands and I was just squeezing it and it was white and it's like those kids toys, those little balls that you squeeze and it pops out kind of like a frog when its throat goes, you know, you squeeze it. That was like what my heart was like in my hands. And I felt like through continual process and prayer and surrendering and coming to God, he was helping me. He doesn't pull our fingers off. He doesn't do what we don't want, but he helped me to be able to be willing to start to open up my hands and then I would take it back. But eventually it was like developing a spiritual muscle so that it became easier to do that. And then I had a new image in my mind of this heart that was just healthy and thriving and pulsing and colorful and alive and radiant. And so um, he helped me to loosen my grip on my heart. And what I'd like to do is just take a moment, if you want to, and we're going to use our imagination because it's such a gift that God gives us. And I know that some of us are better at it than others, but even if you just see a scribble or a stick figure, God still speaks in amazing ways. So if you want to, close your eyes and cup your hands together and hold your hands in front of you. I want you to imagine that you are holding your heart in your hands. 
Because you are, you do hold your heart. You are the one, it's your will and your mind and your core and your center that holds it. And look at it, what is the condition of your heart? What do you notice? What color is it? How are you holding it? What's your grip? How does it feel? What does it need? What is it longing for? Can you sense if there's anything hidden that God might want to shine his light on? Can you surrender your heart to him? He wants to make it new. If you want to, you can say this prayer silently. Jesus, I give you my heart. Wash it and make it pure and new. Amen. This is something that you can do anytime, anywhere. Just hold your hands out and use your imagination and come to God. He will meet you there. And even if you've given your life to him, if there's parts that you're holding back, you know, your heart has different chambers, different rooms in it. You might have opened the front room and said, hey, welcome in, and you've got the, the cushions on the couch all fluffed and everything looks great, but you're like, I don't want you to go in the garage or that back room. You know, maybe you're just giving him part, but he's saying he wants, he wants all of our heart because it's good. He wants to make it alive and healthy. So continue this if there's something that he's working on in you. And so in order to have the pure heart, the next thing that we do is what we did. We pray and we are cleansed. We ask God to create a clean heart in us and he dips our heart in the streams of life. In Titus 3 verse 5, it says, He saved us not by the righteous deeds that we had done, but according to his mercy, through the washing of new birth and renewal by the Holy Spirit. Um, I have a kid's book and it talks about the, the meaning and origin of the word the, the power of the Holy Spirit. It's super mega dynamite. We have this power inside of us that is beyond imagining. When we come to Jesus, he says, I don't leave you as an orphan. He gives you his spirit to do that cleaning from the inside out daily. He's our teacher. He's with us. He's our comforter, our counselor. He seals us in Jesus' name. It's amazing. So, so good. In John 3, Three, it says, Jesus answered him, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And we've been learning that blessed are the pure in heart for they shall see God. So we need to be born again in order to have a pure heart and see God, this reward. He reveals himself to us. Second Corinthians 5, 17 says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new, ha Behold, the new has come. So you guys are new creations when you, when you give your heart to Christ. You are made new. You're hidden in him. For you've died with Christ to the world. Your life is hidden in him. Those that join themselves with the Lord are one in union in pure heart. So how do we keep our hearts pure? What happens when we walk out the door and drive down the street and get to our house and somebody cuts us off? And <laughs> how do we keep our hearts pure? We abide in Christ. We stay connected to him like the vine and the branch. We participate and collaborate with the work that he's doing through his spirit in us. We're his workmanship. It's like we're, we're on the potter's wheel and he's shaping and molding our heart into something amazing that we can't even imagine. It's a lifelong pro process and we are a work in progress. Another way to keep our hearts pure, I think, is to play. Playing is really important, and we have so much going on, we often forget. It could be just as simple as taking off your shoes and being barefoot. Go walk in the grass or the sand. The earth longs to feel your feet, and you need to feel the earth. Uh, you can play a, play a game, dance, or go to a park. Swing on a swing. I love the swing sets. <laughs> Never get tired of that. Um, cultivate wonder. You can spend time with kids. They are really, really, really good company. You can volunteer in the children's ministry. We need new families. I'm serious. So if you're interested, come see me. 
Obeying is another way to keep your heart pure. And obeying sounds like such a, like, obey. Obeying is a beautiful thing. It's an act of trust and an act of love. When we're obeying, we're saying, I trust you, God. I trust you. And because I do, I want to show you my love. And uh, as we do this, in God's word, it says that as we obey, Jesus reveals himself to us. Another thing that we need to do is a daily cleansing. And the daily cleansing that helps our heart to stay pure, it happens through his word. It says that we're washed by his word. As we read his word, we're cleansed and transformed. Our mind is renewed. And it says that as we read the word, the word reads us. The word is able to um, help have the power to discern the thoughts and the intentions of the heart. The other washing we do daily is Jesus washing. Even though he's already cleaned our hearts when we give our hearts to him, he washes the dirt of every day off of us. I was thinking last week or a couple weeks ago with the children, we were doing a lesson on Jesus being a servant and washing his disciples' feet and showing them that no, no job was beneath him and that he wanted to serve others and wanted us to serve and love others. And when he went to wash his disciple Peter's feet, Peter, knowing that he was the Lord and his teacher, said, no, you can't wash my feet. And Jesus said, if I don't wash your feet, you have no part with me. So Peter said, wash all of me then, Lord, head to toe. And Jesus told him, he said, if you've bathed, all you need to do is wash your feet to be clean. And that's true with us in our hearts. If we've bathed our heart and given our heart to Christ, we just need the daily cleansing of coming to him and, and asking for forgiveness when we do something wrong. And we do that through prayer. That's another way we keep our hearts pure. Everywhere, all the time, about everything we pray. We confess, we give thanks, we ask for things. And one type of prayer is an examine, which is a daily reflective prayer developed by Ignatius. And that helps us to find the movement of God in all the people and events of our everyday life. It's simply a set of introspective prompts that we follow. We might ask, where, where was am I high today? Where was my low? Where did I notice God? Where do I feel his presence? Where did I feel his absence? And doing this daily kind of prayer helps us. We bring ourselves honestly to him. In Psalm 139, verse 23 and 24, it says, search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts and see if there be any grievous way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. Wow, this is a great verse. It's a great prayer, but it can be really scary. When I first started using it as a prayer, I thought, well, I don't know. Do I really want you to search me? Because I'm not sure if I want you to see everything in my heart. And I'm pretty sure there's some things that I don't even know that are in there. And if you see it, then we're going to have to do something about it. And maybe I just don't want to pray this prayer. But I feel like the Spirit, as he's so faithful, working in me and working in you, he gave me this prayer that says, God, I'm willing to be willing, or I want to want to pray this, so I'm going to dip my toe in the water, and will you meet me there and help me to have more courage to pray? Because he already knows what's in our heart. He's fashioned our hearts for him, and he wants them to be healthy and thriving, so he'll meet us there as we just, that's idea of just turning to him and looking at him. And then he helps us to go farther. To, you're not scared to pray that anymore. You're like, God, I know you're with me. Whatever work you're doing is good. You're going to help me, and it's going to be it's going to be glorious. It's going to bring glory. In um, Oswald Chambers' book, My Utmost for His Highest, he says the greatest characteristic, characteristic a Christian can exhibit is the completely unveiled openness before God, which allows that person's life to become a mirror for others. When the Spirit fills us, we are transformed, and by beholding God, we become mirrors. You can always tell when someone has been beholding the glory of the Lord because your inner spirit senses that he mirrors the Lord's own character. The most important rule for us is to concentrate on keeping our lives open to God. So we come to him honestly, authentically, not hiding anything back, asking him to search us. And this helps us to also be changed and transformed in the gazing at him. Another thing that we can do to keep our hearts pure is to watch over our thoughts. And I have a picture from this, one of my favorite kids' books called uh, Thoughts to Make Your Heart Sing. And um, it says, sometimes bad thoughts just land in your head from nowhere. Is having an awful thought a sin? 
When Jesus was tempted in the desert, Satan whispered awful thoughts and lies to Jesus to tempt him away from God. It's not the thoughts that count. It's what we do with these thoughts. He didn't believe them, and he sent them away. An old proverb says, you can't help it if birds come and land on your head, but you don't have to let them build nests in your hair. So we take every thought captive to make it obedient to Christ. We watch over our thoughts because our thoughts become words, our words become actions, our actions become habits, our habits become the character, and the character becomes our life. So it starts with our thoughts. Uh, Dallas Willard in his book, Life Without Lack, Living in the Fullness of Psalm 23, says that the more we think about God, the more we are transformed. Our thoughts are the rails upon which our lives run. So it's good to take time to think about what you think about. What is it that is constantly going through your head? Sometimes it's hard. Sometimes there are frustrations, arguments, things you're replaying. And you can try to find something else to replace it with, or God to help you process through it. I call that God thoughts. I'm always asking him, God, can I have some God thoughts? Um, The other thing Dallas Willard did was included this quote in his book, And it says, first of all, my child, think magnificently of God. Magnify his providence. Adore his power. Pray to him frequently and incessantly. Bear him always in your mind. Teach your thoughts to reverence him in every place, for there is no place where he is not. Therefore, my child, fear and worship and love God first and last. Think magnificently of him. We set our mind on God. We let God be the resting place between all other thoughts, our our true north, our center, the place our mind returns to. And when our mind and hope is fixed on Jesus, we purify ourselves like Christ is pure. As we're thinking about God, we can be encouraged to know that his eternal mind is alive with precious thoughts for us, more than the grains of sand by the sea more than the grains of the sand and all the sand dunes and all the deserts of all the world. Those are his thoughts towards us. So as we practice ways to keep our heart pure, uh, we have benefits from it. And that benefit is that we will see God. The word see means to behold, to gaze, observe, and discern clearly, to experience, apprehend through the senses. Seeing is knowing And the psalmist said, Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. I love that um, seeing actually means to experience too. So as we gaze at God, we are experiencing him. And the eye is the illuminator of the soul. The eye is the lamp of the body. So if your eye is clear, your whole body will be full of light. So just like we watch over our thoughts, we also want to have a like we have a diet of the mind of what we're thinking about, but a diet of, of the visual. What are we looking at? What are we taking in? Because the things that we take in will affect how spiritually receptive we are. As we behold God, our inward heart is changed in his presence. His essence, being, and light flow in us and through us to others. We uh, gaze at God. We set our minds to return to, to the God thoughts. We develop a habit of inwardly gazing upon him. And as we do this, we're lifted up into a sanctuary. Uh, David said, One thing I have asked of the Lord that I will seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. Uh, Trisha is somebody that helps me in the children's ministry, and she was having a rough day, and she said she felt like God was encouraging her, that she felt like God said, Chin up. And I love how God can speak something so simple, but it could be so powerful. Chin up, look up. Sometimes I do. I look up. I hear a bird, and I'm like, where's that bird coming from? I look to see where it is, or I look at the sky just as a reminder physically of what's happening spiritually. As we look up, we're lifted up into a sanctuary no matter where we are. 1 Corinthians 2, 9, and 10 says, But as it is written, what no eye has seen, nor ear heard, nor the heart of God, man imagined what God has prepared for those who love him. These things God has revealed to us through the Spirit, for the Spirit searches everything, even the depths of God. Our present spiritual side of God is a foreshadow of the full and final revelation. And 2 Corinthians 3.18 says, And we all with unveiled face beholding the glory of the Lord are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. I just learned something this past week, which I think is so cool. It's something called imaginal cells. 
So the word image, imago Dei, is the image of God. Um, caterpillars have something in their body called imaginal cells, which are these cells that have information that's hidden in there for the time when it comes for them to be transformed into a butterfly. We have imaginal cells. We have image cells in the image of God, our creator, to become uh, like him. And so I just think it's such an interesting and beautiful thing to think about. We see this whole transformation of a caterpillar to a butterfly. And I think in our life, we have a lot of death and rebirth and death and rebirth. But one day we're going to be in heaven and it will be final and complete. And it will be beyond what we can even imagine. Um, God, Elroy E. is one of his names. It means the God who sees. He sees us. And when we look at God, he is like the father in the story of the prodigal son. He beholds us a long way off and he runs to hasten our return to him. God sees us through Christ-colored glasses. Not like rose-colored glasses, but Christ-colored glasses. He sees us clean and pure and redeemed. And we likewise see God through Christ-colored glasses because he's the exact representation and image of him. Hebrews 1.3 says, the sun is the radiance of God's glory, the exact representation of his nature, upholding all things by his powerful word. After he had provided purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. So what I'd like to do is I'm going to close in a prayer that comes from, I'm just going to pray a verse over you from Ephesians 1.17 from the Amplified Bible. But then after that, there's a very short chorus of a song that I'd love to sing with you. So I've invited Mo to sing it on my behalf. <laughs> but I will, I will join with you. But let me pray for you before we do that. Lord God, thank you so much for your word. Thank you for your promises, for your light and your love and your goodness. I pray that you, uh, the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, would grant us a spirit of wisdom and a revelation that give a deep and personal and intimate insight into the true knowledge of you. For we know the Father through the Son, and I pray that the eyes of our heart, the very center and core of our being, may be enlightened, flooded with light by the Holy Spirit, so that we will know and cherish the hope, the divine guarantee, the confident expectation to which he has called us the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints, and so that we will begin to know what the immeasurable and unlimited and surpassing greatness of his active spiritual power is in us who believe. These are in accordance with the working of his mighty strength. Praise you. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Amen. So the song is just a simple lullaby that one of our... Um, uh, children's volunteers used to sing Alex Phillips and I loved it and it it just says it comes from an old hymn it says into my heart into my heart come into my heart Lord Jesus come in today come in to stay come into my heart Lord Jesus if you want to sing that song with us Mo's going to sing it you can as soon as you feel like you want to jump in jump in she's going to sing it once and then again so
So that song has been so special to me after she did it with the kids. I tell you, if I have a bad dream or I can't sleep or I'm driving and somebody cuts me off and I'm angry, this song just kind of springs to my mind and it really does help to center me. So I pray that you are blessed today and that whatever God is doing in your heart right now, that he would seal it with his spirit and continue that good work. So be blessed.